super excited to be here to talk to you about this technology today. There are a few opportunities, uh, hopefully more than zero, in the life of a technologist when they know that the research, the technology that they work on, really matters. And the technology that we are all interested in here and we're all contributing to does matter in a very significant way. And whether it will be Libra or whether it will be something else or whether it will be both or all of them together, we are changing the fabric of society, of money, of financial services, and of the world. It will happen. Have no doubt it will take longer. There might be some hurdles. It will happen. And the other reason I'm super excited to talk about it is because at the heart of this technology disruption is something uh, that we care about as technologies very much, and that's um, decentralized algorithms and uh, consensus. And if you followed the news in the last week, we all know that forming agreement consensus may be a little bit more difficult than you know, we think. And we know it's tough, so it's a tough te technical problem and uh, a very exciting one and very fascinating one to work on. So this is uh, David Marcus, the uh, head of uh, uh, Calibra, uh, testifying, you know, in a photo testifying in front of the Congress. Just out of curiosity, how many in this audience watched any part of this uh, testimony on YouTube? Okay, many of them. How many of you notice a congressperson ask him, okay, so this Libra Association is gonna form decisions by a quorum of two thirds. How many noticed that question? Did you jump when you watched it and say two thirds plus one, two thirds plus one? So I think this is pretty cool when a congressperson talks about consensus, quorums, two thirds, all of this. Um, this is amazing. We live in an amazing time where this, uh, these algorithms and this technology that we work on uh, are really, um, the focus of interest and fascination and a lot, a lot of curiosity and a lot of openness from the world to understand them and to understand how they bring security to change uh, the way we do financial services. So the journey of these technologies starts about four decades ago with uh, Leslie Lampert and some of his colleagues, uh, the pioneers of this, of this field. And they really gave us the foundations that we still carry today for thinking about these problems and the pillars, the concepts, the terminology, the impossibilities, and also the early solutions for addressing this fundamental problem of executing um, distributed software correctly, correctly and consistently. And this slide is a shameless brag of a book that's about to come out. It will be live on the AC1 Digital Library, I'm told, next week. And um, I'm kind of... Um, allowing myself to put this up because really I was only the editor and the content is uh, contributed by wonderful um, uh, contributors. Um, and you can find a lot of the early concepts, these uh, uh, ter um, uh, terms and uh, fundamental pillars of this uh, field of concurrency, things like Byzantine failures, the consensus problem itself, Paxos, some of the other solutions, uh, you can find them uh, discussed in the retrospect of uh, uh, history already there. Now these founders invented and coined all of this uh, field uh, to solve a very different problem than the one uh, we're talking about today. They really looked at uh, um, a system of four computers in a mission critical setting, you know, the um, a cockpit of a uh, spacecraft, and they needed to build a control system that had uh, resilience. And this is what made them uh, invent uh, Byzantine fault tolerance. Bitcoin was the one who showed a much more scalable, much more serious and you know, global use case for Byzantine fault tolerance. And unfortunately, as we know, the solution they gave really does not solve Byzantine fault tolerance and has you know, serious problems of uh, you know, energy waste, uh, scaling, and um, um, not really the solution that will give global um, adoption and serious ado uh, adoption by the enterprises. So this caused a renewed interest in the classical way of solving Byzantine fault tolerance and a very accelerated uh, development that unlocked innovation, originality, and some very fascinating uh, results in technology. 
So here's just a, you know, an example, a very skewed one uh, from you know, perhaps the Dahlia point of view on some of the um, way this uh, innovation has been accelerated. So um, if you just focus on the problem of Byzantine consensus with practical um, settings in mind, you know, in the partial synchrony model, um, then it took about 17 years for the community to come up with the first practical solution, the one that was done next door here by uh, Castro and Liskov. Um, and this was uh, PBFT. And then um, there was a quest for uh, achieving linear uh, solutions. Linearity means that you don't really pay fundamentally more than what you would have to pay just to spread the decision itself, just to send that, that's already linear. And um, getting agreement and getting solutions that pays just about that price was uh, the quest for about two decades. The first of which is one that I will uh, call uh, the age of uh, uh, the decade of confusion, where the community as a whole for about a decade went down the wrong track, which we then showed was flawed. Uh, and then in the past four years, um, a really fascinating and tremendous accelerated uh, innovation and uh, solutions fixed those problems and very quickly came up with um, uh, the, uh, the final result, um, which a lot, a lot of blockchains uh, are now basing on, uh, including our own uh, uh, technology at uh, Libra. Um, uh, this finally pro provides you know, this uh, linearity of solution. So this is the case where a use case for scalability and for strong technology uh, has really driven a lot of research and a lot of innovation uh, and some fascinating um, technology in this area. So fast forward to today, we are building at Calibra a technology that will provide global currency uh, for everybody to use and for everybody to be able uh, to access. So Libra is gonna be a very different uh, uh, type of uh, digital technology. Uh, it is build, built on um, an engine that decentralizes trust. It is also different in very other ways in the way the market design and the um, uh, stability of the currency is going to be managed. Here, I wanna talk mostly uh, about the technology that underlies Libra, and that's a database of programmable resources, which is replicated using the power of uh, decentralized algorithms with Byzantine fault tolerance. And we've announced that at launch date, this technology will be um, uh, deployed among a set of permissioned participants, uh, the founding members of the Libra Association, and down the line, we will open it for um, uh, open participation using stake and uh, other methods. I want to spend just one slide about um, the technology that Calibra is delivering and then quickly switch back to uh, technical areas. So Calibra is the company that Facebook has uh, um, established to uh, build a product which is a custodial wallet um, uh, that allows payments and transactions with the Libra coin. Libra is the blockchain, which is an open technology um, um, governed by association of multiple members. Uh, at announcement date, they were at 28, and at launch date, we plan for there to be uh, 100. And Calibra is the product, whereas Libra is the blockchain and the open uh, currency, where Calibra is just one out of uh, many other members. An analogy is, Libra is the highway, and uh, Calibra is one of the many cars driving on this highway. Libra is open for uh, other applications and other services to be built uh, on top of it. I want to switch back very uh, uh, quickly to the technical uh, uh, part. So when you build such a serious technology with poten you know, the potential of changing uh, society and the potential of reaching global uh, reach. Uh, what do we worry about and what keeps us up at night and what uh, do we want to work uh, uh, on technically? So I wanna talk about some of the uh, questions that we raise on going beyond the current solutions for building info tolerance 
And I'll mention you know, one perhaps small step towards uh, uh, addressing these concerns, and also you know, put it out to the community to start thinking about uh, some of the really difficult problems uh, we have there. So the classical approach to Byzantine fault tolerance, using experts like me, like Itai, you know, like many of the other experts here, is um, you start with some of the known foundations uh, and the well understood theoretical underpinnings of the area. And the first thing we ask ourselves as experts is, is the network synchronous or asynchronous? Are we going to rely on synchronous bounds to guarantee the consistency? And if yes, then we know that we can tolerate up to half uh, of the participants uh, going rogue using Byzantine. And if not, we know that there are lower bounds that say only a third. And if we go with the synchronous approach, then we further have to um, uh, determine what is this bound that we assume on the network. I mean, typically, this is a, uh, something that's denoted as delta in the academic papers. Once we've done that, we can go to the literature, um, you know, survey the myriad of papers and solutions that uh, we have there, maybe invent some of our own, and then, um, uh, you know, in the case that we have uh, practical solutions, we may choose the partial synchrony model and assume that there are more, at most a third uh, Byzantine participants, come up with the solutions that we like, and deploy it. So this is the standard approach uh, that we all uh, follow, and this is the way systems um, need to be designed. So why the hell do we need uh, something uh, new? Well, so there are so several um, uh, concerns, several uh, um, opportunities that I'd like us to consider. Well, the first one is, yeah, we do have these very rigorous, very well understood bounds. And they say half or a third um, a Byzantine uh, fault tolerance, depending on the setting that we uh, assume. But the question is, is the model the right one? Is Byzantine fault tolerance really, you know, with these resilient, resilience bounds, is this really giving us the right analysis for the problem that we're solving? If you think about it, Again, going back to the settings where we are launching the Libra uh, blockchain. Um, we're going to have a set of very strong, very credible um, uh, you know, industry leaders participating in the uh, infrastructure and in the uh, backend of uh, these systems. Is it really reasonable to assume Byzantine failures for these set of uh, uh, members? These are members that run services 24-7, credibly and reliably for years. They have the best systems, the best administrators operating these services. Is it really reasonable to assume that up to a third or up to a half can go uh, Byzantine? The second question is, are we really going to de design the system statically once with an administrator design and assume that that's the design that's going to stay forever? In particular, while running the systems, we may learn in runtime, in uh, uh, operation, uh, that various things are happening in the system. We can actually observe failures or network behavior, our conditions, that can change uh, the way we um, uh, model uh, the system. And so the question is, can we do that? Can we support multiple assumptions under the same deployed implementation and adapt it to variant conditions? And the third one is uh, the one that keeps me up at night. Well, what happens in the end where some assumption is violated? What are we going to do? Well, the current uh, theory says, OK, throw your hands in the air and give up. Everything collapses, liveness, safety, everything. Is it really the best we can do? And can we support anything uh, despite a violation of our assumptions? And the last one is, what happens if a disaster really happens and we lost a quorum in our system? Does that mean that we actually have to lose transactions and lose money? This is a serious technology that we're working about. We are working on you know, something that is relevant. This is not just an academic paper. So obviously, I'm putting all these questions because um, I have some insights and some first steps uh, indicating that uh, maybe um, uh, we are able to provide some solutions to these really hard problems. And I encourage the community to work further on it. Um, and in fact, there have been works that addressed some of these uh, really hard questions already. This is not completely new. Um, so the first thing uh, that people have done, and sort of the obvious uh, approach, is to say, well, let's just assume there are fewer Byzantine failures. 
It's not a third. Okay? And this goes under um, the premise that Byzantine failures are the worst type of failures that can happen. And yeah, maybe we can have, in addition to Byzantine failures, uh, benign crash failures. So maybe we'll have one attacker in the system. But in addition, we might have some you know, benignly crashed or you know, uh, uh, faults or, or delayed messages or omitted uh, packets. Um, so some, some, some works in this uh, hybrid fault model uh, have already been presented, uh, both in asynchronous setting and synchronous settings. I don't want to mention who was the first uh, because I don't want to uh, accidentally miss uh, uh, someone, but there definitely are, are works in the literature on this hybrid fault model. But again, these fault models fundamentally assume that Byzantine greater than everything. Right? Byzantine is the worst uh, type of failure that uh, can happen. What I want to talk about briefly uh, today is some uh, advances um, that uh, we've worked on now recently uh, called uh, flexible Byzantine fault tolerance, where we don't assume that Byzantine are the fail uh, worst type of failures. And the last thing addresses you know, what happens if you do lose a quorum, when all bets are off. Can you still salvage the transactions that have been committed? And you know, maybe you sold a house and you receive a million dollar payment and you really, really want that million dollar not to be lost. I won't talk about that today. We do have some uh, uh, ongoing work uh, in that area. And again, encourage everybody to uh, continue it. So for the remaining uh, 10 minutes or so, I want to focus on uh, flexible uh, BFT. This is a joint work with uh, uh, Kartik and Ling, a postdoc uh, that I worked with in the past year. And this is also work um, that will appear um, uh, in the coming uh, uh, CCS conference in uh, London. So very briefly, in, uh, you know, in a nutshell, uh, flexible Byzantine fault tolerance uh, provides two contributions. One, stronger resilience. So with flexible BFT, with this new model, we can tolerate higher number of corruption faults, you know, of malicious attacks in the system, than any uh, of the known lower bounds, both for synchronous and for asynchronous settings without breaking any impossibilities, without violating any of the known results. And the second component is diversity. So it allows at different times to conclude different things about the system using different points of views of learning what has been committed in the system. So depending on the assumptions and what is observed on the system, you can learn commits uh, by different um, uh, learners. And so the way this works is with this new model where we introduce a new type of fault that uh, we call alive but corrupt. And in short, ABC. So what are alive but corrupt faults? So alive but corrupt faults in a nutshell assume that for the most part, the participants in the infrastructure of a blockchain supporting you know, a financial system have interest in maintaining the system live and in connect, collecting fees from it and in committing and um, following through with transactions. What they do potentially have interest in, if they want to cheat, is in um, you know, breaking the consistency. They might want to double spend you know, the same coin. They might want to uh, fork the system, but not to prevent the system from being live. Okay, so rather than saying Byzantine is greater than or equal crash fault, I'm saying the other way around. There's no reason for very strong participants that operate 24 seven systems to stop being reliable. There is a system for them, there is an incentive for them potentially, if they are corrupt, to try to cheat. So this active but corrupt model says the attacker wants to uh, attack safety but not liveness. And this is exactly the opposite of you know, previous models, assumptions, hybrid or not. The total number of corruptions is the total number of Byzantine, which could be you know, either crashed uh, uh, or benign faulty or corrupt, as well as these ABC faults. And with this model, we can break away from all the known uh, resilience uh, bounds. The second contribution um, has to do with this uh, diverse point of view on the system. So in one protocol, in one family of protocols, we're able to support learners with different assumptions. The same protocol, 
the same deployed system can support uh, different points of view. And in particular, learners can come, they can make their own decisions, and perhaps the most surprising one, surprising one of those is that the same system could be both, can support both synchronous learners or asynchronous learners. So there can be um, learners that want to be very safe um, against you know, some threshold, a third or more of corruptions, uh, and against asynchrony. And other learners who have more patience and want to wait the maximum you know, assume network bounds until they get a higher level of assurance assuming these synchronous bounds. The third contribution of this approach is that we can support recovery. So if uh, a presumed resilience bound has been broken, we can go to, back to the system and change our, oops, change our assumptions and pick the one that was correct under a stronger assumption. From a technical point of view, flexible BFT has two components. The first one is a new protocol, a synchronous uh, Byzantine fault tolerant protocols that despite using synchrony to guarantee safety, um, advances without any uh, explicit steps that delay the synchronous bound. So this is the first um, protocol that works in an asynchronous way and only the learner that looks at the system and waits to learn when a transaction has committed applies uh, assumptions about the synchronous uh, bounds and uh, decides when to commit. The protocol itself is deployed without any delta assumptions, without any delay steps. Only the final step, the one that um, you know, an external client of the system observes, only that one applies synchrony assumptions on the system. The system itself does not uh, wait 10 minutes or, or you know, 10 seconds uh, at all. And this is a new protocol. Um, and if you think about you know, your standard diagram of distributed uh, protocols, synchronous protocols, and don't try to really read into the protocol here, it's just meant as a, uh, as a, um, you know, as a graphics. Uh, the standard protocol will look like, oh, okay, we have these uh, synchronous periods, uh, you know, epochs that wait the maximum delay, send messages, and then wait again, and they advance from um, uh, one synchronous round to another. Um, and our new protocol will not have any of these uh, um, uh, synchronization uh, epochs. The protocol will look uh, completely asynchronous. And it also happens to be the most simple a uh, synchronous protocol that I can think of and one that I think can uh, become a textbook uh, a protocol. So it's really very natural to just get rid of all these delay steps. And the second contribution uh, uh, from a technical point of view is this notion of flexible Byzantine quorum systems that uses the new fault model, the ABC fault model. And very, very briefly on the technical part, the fundamental um, threshold uh, um, you know, lower bounds that we have in uh, this field stem from the fact that uh, we're using quorum systems that assume the same bound for uh, liveness and for safety. So we have this notion of Q, the size of a quorum that we need to drive a decision. And Q has to be small enough to guarantee that we can get messages from Q. All right, so at most one minus Q can be... Um, you know, a fraction, min one minus Q can be uh, crash faulty. And at the same time, the intersection between quorums is the one that guarantees safety. With the ABC model, we can break away from this because Q can be much larger. Because we're assuming that ABC faults are not going to attack liveness. So we can wait for a much larger Q and uh, liveness will be maintained and the um, uh, intersection that we get uh, has much higher resilience. So this tension between safety and liveness is broken, and this is what allows us to bypass, not to break, but to uh, come up with a different approach to, uh, get, to break away from the uh, resilience bounds. So what can we do with uh, flexible BFT? A lot. <laughs> Wonders. Um, so here's one thing you can do. You can start running a system, and you, if you observe, let's say, P, um, um, active participation that you know could be Byzantine, they could be correct, but they can definitely not crash. You observe, observe those. What you could do is you can take away those P that you see participation of, 
out of the resilience bound that you assume for Byzantine. So if you assumed a third Byzantine fault tolerant, you could say, oh, OK, a third minus p at most could be Byzantine, because I already have messages or you know, evidence of participation from p that are uh, active. They might be corrupt. I don't know. They might be trying to double spend or you know, cheat, but they're definitely active. I can see messages from them. OK, so you say, well, that's fine. So you split the third threshold between corrupt and um, uh, you know, uh, potentially crushed. So the magic here is that you can now wait for, you know, this is not a very uh, complex math, but one minus this uh, remaining threshold of uh, uh, Byzantine that you don't know about. And you get the extra resilience of the P that you observed for free. So you can still have a third corruption plus the P that you observed. So you're not just splitting the third, you're actually getting a third plus P that you observed uh, uh, resilience. What else can you do with uh, a flexible BFT? Um, so like I said, you can already use uh, what you observe in the system to uh, increase your assumption on uh, um, uh, failure thresholds uh, at runtime. You can also, if you observe participation that is corrupt, you can split, uh, switch between synchronous and asynchronous bound. So if you see corrupt participation, you can see evidence of that. Um, you can then decide to step back and um, start operating in synchronous mode where your resilience can go uh, as high as half, whereas before you can operate in asynchronous mode and move uh, more quickly and be less fault tolerant, and vice versa. If you are operating in asynchronous mode in order to have high resilience, but you notice that the network is experiencing you know, uh, transient periods of uh, um, uh, instability and higher message delays, you can switch to asynchronous mode and uh, you know, suffer lower resilience uh, to Byzantine failures, but then you are safe against uh, asynchrony. You can also, uh, as I mentioned, go back and recover from forking. If you actually see that your assumptions were broken, you can go back and change your assumptions without changing the protocol and using the transcript, transcript of the existing protocol. You can force higher resilience bound on periodic checkpoints of the system. And so uh, wait, let's say, every 1,000 transactions for more uh, um, messages in the system to arrive maybe in a, a retrospect, and then you get a safer uh, checkpoints uh, every period of time. Um, and um, you can differentiate between high stake and normal transactions. You can have transactions that are payments to, I don't know, coffee at a Starbucks, and those don't require very high assurance, as opposed to transactions where you sell your house for a million dollars and uh, wait for higher assurance on those uh, transactions. So generally what you get is a flexible space of guarantees. So what this chart shows is um, the fraction of Byzantine faults on the x-axis as opposed to the fraction of total corruptions on the y-axis. And the area under the curve is impossible because you cannot have total number of faults less than Byzantine. Uh, but normally what you have is only the, you know, the, the line, uh, the boundary of the gray area. Uh, whereas with flexible BFT, you're getting the uh, um, green area for synchronous assumptions in this, uh, I don't know, orange, doesn't look too orange uh, area for asynchronous. So all of these uh, combinations of corruption and uh, Byzantine uh, faults are possible. And the previous chart was for one choice, one design choice of the algorithm itself. All of, that, all of those areas exist and are possible. All of these combinations can be supported with a single choice of the algorithm. But we also have a, a parameter of you know, the algorithm itself that we can deploy um, uh, that gives you various other trade-offs uh, uh, you know, with the different lines. I have two, three minutes? OK. Good. So I just want to uh, step back and say this notion of a system, a deployed system, that you can then use to conclude different things and allows you to recover even if something bad happened um, you know, in a native way, is not at all strange to or is not at all foreign uh, if you think about the current Bitcoin or Nakamoto consensus protocol. So in Nakamoto consensus, you also have a system that may fork 
And you also uh, have higher and higher, you know, increasing assurance levels for different times that the system runs, right? So you, you can have the system forking temporarily and later just one branch, the longest branch uh, wins. So typically people assume uh, and learn that something is committed only when it's buried deeper, you know, certain levels uh, deep in uh, the chain. Uh, and your level of confidence and assurance uh, on the finality of uh, uh, a block in the uh, Nakamoto consensus increases as it gets uh, deeper and, you know, buried deeper and deeper in the chain. So as time goes by, you get, you know, more evidence, more messages, and more time that increases your assurance. And if the system did fork, then um, uh, you know, for a while some assumptions were violated, the system repairs itself. So all of these notions um, are you know, not unusual when you think about uh, the foundations of uh, uh, cryptocurrency systems, but we can now bring them into the classical Byzantine uh, fault tolerant world. So I want to wrap up by just saying uh, uh, I'm here uh, to talk to you um, coming out of uh, Calibra. And um, uh, we have a strong interest in advancing the technology of crypto economics and blockchain systems. Uh, we're doing a lot of research. We'll continue to do that. And uh, we're hiring. So if you have interns, students, postdocs are interested in a career in advancing this technology, please contact us. Thank you. Do you have time for a question or not? Yeah, question. Go ahead. Many. Hi, um, so I want to make a controversial statement and then uh, suggest a direction forward. Um, consensus is not a financial instrument, right? Consensus is a necessary but not sufficient condition to have a financial instrument. So there's another half of the problem there, and that is how does it become a financial instrument in the first place? Um, so what Satoshi did is he really took this notion of trust, which is in all the BFT papers. Trust is an axiom upon which you can make proofs, but it was always kind of a terrible assumption because it can be violated, right? I can bribe an operator. The right kind of market movement can violate the assumptions upon which those axioms are based and therefore violate all the proofs that the BFT uh, is based upon. So what Satoshi did is he cast that in economic terms, right? He said, okay, so now we're going to throw away the trust. We're going to have miners, and the miners are going to actually pay real-world money to do this. And he made it an economic instrument through the mining process. It's not a waste. It's actually how it becomes a financial instrument in the first place. There's a middle ground, right, where people make a different axiomatic assumption. That is that I have a database, and the thing in the database is a financial instrument. And let's call all of these proof of stake, right? And there's a, but there's a third way here that I, I still don't see happening, and that is... Um, Let's call it native issuance plus economic assumptions. So if I have a database, regardless of type, regardless of trust, and I issue an asset into it, let's call it a debt instrument, let's call it an equity, a bond, or a fiat dollar, and I add to that economic assumptions instead of trust assumptions, that, that is perhaps a path forward for the kind of things that Calibra is doing. Because in the middle ground for you guys, um, you have a database. Okay, so I made a database. It's the most awesome database ever, and I, I love your work on this, by the way. Um, but then I it didn't make it a financial instrument. I made a consensus protocol, but not a financial instrument. And then I have to say, okay, where did the dollars come from or the other uh, fiat instruments come from to make it a financial instrument? And that is no longer a computer science problem. That is a problem. So I'm going to stop you right there areas. because we have time short. I'm I am done. in violent yeah. agreement with you. I think we all are. I think the nature of the disruption here is harnessing economics and incentives to drive security. Absolutely uh, uh, in agreement on that. And um, I think one small step that I presented today is to first of all say these economic incentives are um, what we need is to drive them again, you know, to, to guarantee and to guard against corrupt behavior and not worry about liveness. So as we work on the right models for that, that's a small step that I was trying to uh, get across here. We really don't need to worry about liveness. These systems are live. These uh, operators are trusted for years to drive live systems. But I absolutely agree with you that the community, and that's, I think, uh, the nature of this community and this conference, the key question is uh, uh, for, all, for all of us to work on the mechanisms that guarantee that we can harness economical behavior, design, incentives, to guarantee the security of these systems so that they can build um, a financial institutions. This has nothing to do uh, specifically with Calibra, but I'm happy to say that on behalf of uh, Calibra. Yeah. 
Uh, just a few more words, if you may, on uh, expanding or switching between the now and the future state. Uh, from 100 uh, nodes and validators to an open system? Is that what you suggested? Yeah, so um, we are guaranteed. Uh, we are guaranteeing to open the participation and to share with the community the design, and we're working on the techniques that will do that. Yes, and we will share it with the community at uh, launch date. We're committed to that. Yes. Hi, um, just a question about, I, I liked what you were talking about. We're going to try Thank and you. address um, corrupt. Uh, what is it? Alive but corrupt. Can you say ABC. a little bit more Very about easy. what goes into the corrupt bucket and who decides what's corrupt? Is that made at the beginning of the creation of the blockchain? Can the definition of what's corrupt behavior change over the course of time? Um, so the, how does the that work? Yeah, so the academic answer to this is anything that deviates from the protocol. Um, in practice, a lot of deviations uh, are really easy to handle. Like if you send me a message that has the wrong format, I'll just drop it. That's easy. If you DDoS me, then you know uh, it's a different problem for network engineers and for um, you know infrastructure to fight uh, DDoS attacks. So really, what we're talking about is uh, intentional, uh, deliberate attempt to break the safety of the protocol and to cause a fork or to cause a commit to disappear from the system, uh, you know, a payment uh, to go through despite not having funds, uh, you know, things that actually break the correct behavior of the system. So again, the academic answer is anything that uh, deviates from the protocol. Yep? Yes. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. I'm going to be around here today and tomorrow. Feel free to reach out to me, and thank you.